Welcome to Harvard Business Review's The New World of Work. I'm Adi Ignatius, Editor-in-Chief of HBR, and each week on the show I interview a CEO or a thought leader or somebody else who can inspire and educate us on the changing dynamics of the workplace. Our viewers come from all over the world and they work at everything from Fortune 500 companies to fledgling startups, from family businesses to nonprofits. The aim of the show is to provide insights for everyone as they navigate this transitional moment in how we organize ourselves in the business world. So on today's episode, we have another great guest, Jim Fielding, a longtime entertainment industry executive and author of the new book, All Pride, No Ego, A Queer Executive's Journey to Living and Leading Authentically. So I'll come back in just a second with a proper introduction, but first let's hear from our good friends at KPMG, who are our sponsors for this season of The New World of Work. At KPMG, it's our people who make the difference for our clients. Talented teams leveraging the right technology to uncover insights that illuminate opportunity. Ready to make the difference together? Okay, if you're an HPR subscriber and you're watching this, you can head to hpr.org slash newsletters to sign up for the New World of Work newsletter, where I offer an inside look each week at these interviews and talk about some of the most interesting takeaways. And if you like content like this, please consider subscribing to our magazine and website. The address is hbr.org slash subscriptions. And if you like hearing smart people talk about some of the same issues we discuss on this show, be sure to check out our flagship podcast, IdeaCast, which is available wherever you get your podcast. And remember, you can watch previous episodes of this show on YouTube or right here on LinkedIn and Facebook. So my guest today is Jim Fielding, a guy who's done a lot of things. He held several senior jobs in the entertainment business. He was president of consumer products and innovation at 20th Century Fox. He was global head for consumer products and retail development at DreamWorks Animation. He was CEO of the Claire's Stores chain, and he was president of Disney Store Worldwide. He currently serves as president of the media production company Archer Gray's CoLab division, which focuses on part on building businesses via venture investments. And last but not least, He's the author of the new book, All Pride, No Ego, A Queer Executive's Journey to Living and Leading Authentically. Jim, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Incredible uh, honor. Good. Well, I hope I didn't take up all the time by listing your many achievements, but I'm really, <laughs> I'm glad you're here. Um, so let's just jump right in. And, and I, you know, your, your book is, as you put it, A Queer Executive's Journey. So let's, let's talk about that journey in some yeah. ways. But I want to, I want to ask you about some numbers. So Fortune Magazine re recently calculated that there are four openly gay CEOs in the Fortune 500. That's up from zero in 2014 when, when Tim Cook came out or was outed, however you think right. that. Um, but you know, when, you, when you hear that number, you know, wh what do you think? How do you process that? Uh, not surprising, uh, frustrating, and I think partially you know, part of the message of the book. Uh, I think if you just use the law of averages, and you say, okay, 10% of the, the country is queer, LGBTQ, that percentage doesn't make sense. But I also think, you know, Adi, if you talked about the other, you know, women, people of color, minorities, the other minorities or marginalized communities, the numbers would be low as well. Uh, and so I, I also, it makes me kind of sad because I think that means there's wasted talent uh, because I know in my community how many bright, creative, innovative, talented people there are that deserve their shot uh, in the C-suite. So, so your answer, so you're not saying that, oh, there must be many more who are in the closet <laughs> who aren't comfortable coming out, rather that- That could, that could be. I mean, I, you know, I can't speak for you know, the other 496, I guess, if there's four in their survey. Uh, I think it varies by industry. I think it varies by you know, everybody's individual story. And I'm certainly not here to force people to share their stories or to out people, uh, to your point. Um, so I, it may be higher, uh, but if the person's not comfortable identifying that way or sharing their story, then we have to respect that. Yeah, sure. Um, so to the audience, if you have questions for Jim, you know, put them into the chat. We'll try to get to audience questions later in the show. Sure. Um, so let me ask in your book, uh, which is, which is nice. It's very readable. And, um, Thank you. 
you know, make some some interesting points and and you know, I recommend it. So you say in the book that that there could be an impenetrable glass ceiling mm -hmm. for queer executives in your industry, which by the way is entertainment, and I'm guessing is more queer friendly than a lot of other industries. Yes. So so how have you sensed this glass ceiling? You know, I think it's it's really, I mean, where you feel it, it's almost like an innate sense, you know, it's like an internal feeling of not belonging to the right club. Uh, where it, it, you can pick up, you can sense something in a group meeting or you can sense something in the feedback you might receive from your leader or supervisor or, uh, or in your performance review if you're still at the point where you're getting regular performance reviews. And it's, um, you know, it, it's about sharing stories and sharing commonalities. And in many cases, as a queer executive, when you walk into a room of eight or 10 people, you might be the only self-identifying out gay executive. And so your story by nature is different. And I, I don't have kids. Many, uh, many queer executives do have kids. So I, you know, I can't talk about what schools my kids are applying to or universities they're going to, or it's like, it's just, there's not that, that common language, those common topics that make you fit easily into the conversation. And, you know, you could call it the old boys network. You could call it uh, the men's club. It still feels that way in many situations, including in my industry and from other people I've talked to in other industries. Uh, and I, I think diversity in the C-suite, diversity in the CEO suite overall, not just queer diversity, but I think diversity overall has been a hot topic and will continue to be a hot topic because the C-suites, particularly in America, Fortune 100 or Fortune 500, Fortune 1000, does not really reflect the community at large, the, the constituency of America anymore. Um, but I wanna ask you to what extent maybe that's changed, certainly since you, mm -hmm. you first joined the, the executive forces. I mean, you, you talk in the book about feeling insecure as you've taken new yeah. jobs and whether you could be your authentic self. Right. Um, do you think it would be different today? Do you think things have changed you know, significantly enough that, that you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have the same, you know, same trepidation? Yeah, I mean, I think it's situational, Adi. I think it depends, again, on the industry, on the geography. I, I think, you know, I lived in 20, for 25 years in California. I think there's certain states and uh, legislatures that are more uh, queer friendly. Right now, if I was living in Texas or Florida, I'm not sure I would feel as comfortable. I am reading stories every day of teachers and, you know, education professionals who are feeling they can't live their authentic selves in certain certain states or certain school districts in the United States. So I, I don't think, is it easier than it was when I first came out in the 80s? Yes. Uh, I think there's been a ton of progress. We obviously have more protections than we had when, uh, when I first came out. But I, I, I still think it's very situational. And, and in that case, everybody, you know, you have to take into, into um, consideration the person's individual story, their industry, their tenure with the company, their tenure with the school district before you can really say it's easier. Because I think honestly, in the last year, it's gotten harder for some people. Yeah, interesting. Um, so we do have some comments coming in. A lot of them are, Jim is awesome. I used to work with him. So, <laughs> uh, so that's good. Um, again, if you have questions for Jim and some of those are starting to come in um, as well, put them in the, in the chat. Um, yeah, so you mentioned that, there, that it, it, it varies according to to state or industry. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think about, you know, certain industries where no one dares come out. And that's, yeah. I think of pro sports where, pro sports. you know, close to zero, uh, which, which, you know, I, the, the pressure to remain in the, in the closet in certain places in certain industries. And, you know, can you talk a little bit about just the pressure to remain in the closet, which, which, mm. you know, uh, it, you know, it must be brutal if you're, if you're trying to be, as you say, your authentic self and you feel like society Brutal. is saying, yeah. yeah, no, stay in there. I, I lived, yeah, I lived it. I mean, I wrote about it in the book. I mean, I was in my twenties. I was in my first job. It was in the fashion industry. I was doing extremely well and I was living a double life. I was in a relationship that I wasn't sharing outside of a very tight circle of people changing pronouns, changing stories. And that inauthenticity created emotional, physical, and mental problems. I was having migraines. I was having stomach problems. I was way too young to be feeling that amount of stress and, uh, you know, getting help from a therapist, talking to my really close friends that I could share my story with and, and 
you know, in my case, again, this is the 80s. It was a very different time. I felt like I had to leave that company and search for another role with a company that was going to allow me to fully embrace myself. And that's when I made the move to The Gap and spent nine incredible years at The Gap. And a huge reason I took that job was because during the entire interview process, every person I met with, I presented authentically as myself. And if they asked about my family situation or they asked about things I did on the weekend or what interests me, I didn't switch to a more heterosexual sounding answer. I just answered as myself. Uh, and that was a huge reason why I made that switch in my career. Um, and I know not everybody can do that. I know, I know not every queer individual has the opportunity to move geographies or move companies or uh, you know, move roles. But for me, I, I never felt better. And I honestly think my success started really for me almost when I was 26 and came out because I feel that I was a better executive, a better person, a, a better leader, a better friend, just better to be around because I wasn't, didn't have that level of worry, didn't have that level of stress anymore. I have to ask, what, what is a heterosexual sounding answer? <laughs> Do you, um, does it come with it's a so special funny. Accent? Yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah, exactly. Like you, you, uh, you I have to pick voice. up the yeah, uh, so wife. Say, and... you, you change your voice. Uh, I have to pick up the wife and the golden retriever, and we're going to our <laughs> son's little league game. Um, no, it's yeah, it's funny because I I'm a queer man that absolutely loves sports, so I can do the sports thing because I love <laughs> college and professional sports. But I think it was just you know, I, I couldn't really say, you know, my partner and I went and saw a musical this weekend, right? Like that, at that time, didn't feel like the right answer in many of those situations. Yeah, you're, um, I got it. So, so you're, I mean, I hope your story is in, inspiring to, to, yeah, to people too. who are wrestling with this. You know, there, there must be people who are watching this or, or who would read your book or like, okay, I hear that, I, I, you know, good for you that where you've come out in your journey. Mm -hmm. I just don't dare, you know, I'm, I'm in this state 100%. or in this industry, or I just, it's too scary. You know, what, what, what's your advice to people who are feeling that? Yeah. And, and again, I'm not cavalier about this at all. I, I feel for those people and I, I'm not saying read my book and follow the 10 leadership lessons and, you know, your life will be milk and honey. Uh, I've, I've talked to several people even lately on this journey who absolutely just do not feel comfortable and feel that they would hurt their economic security, their financial security, or their personal security to come out at work, and they don't have the ability to change. So what I've said to them is, I hear that, I respect that, I, I feel sorry for you, but when then, I, then what I ask you to do is when you are at home and when you are in a safe space, is home safe to you? Are the things you're doing outside of work feeding your soul and allowing you to be who you authentically are? Can you volunteer with local queer organizations? Do you get to express your queerness in other ways outside of work? If you have to be that closeted and that concerned at work, then I really hope in your personal life, you can expand, you know, nights and weekends. None of us, even though it feels like we're working full time, we do have our own personal time and we do have choices that we can make. Uh, and so I, of course I ask when somebody comes to me for advice, I ask, do you have the ability to change companies? Do you have the ability to move would that work for you? And if not, then I really encourage them to stretch, stretch their individuality and their authentic, uh, their authenticity outside of work. So I want to jump to an audience question that's apropos of where we are in the conversation. Sure. And this is from Angela in Colorado in the U.S. And Angela says, I have a queer child. What recommendations yeah. would you have to help a young person prepare best for the current working world and to prepare for leadership? Oh, that's amazing. Um, well, first off, the fact that, that your child has a mother that's willing to identify that and you're having that conversation is a huge step in the right direction. And I think it's having those conversations and building their confidence and building their awareness and building their network around them of friends and family so that when they do get challenged and they will get challenged at times, they can proudly sit in their authenticity and share their story. And if it feels in an interview process or a job search process that they're going to ask to change. My feeling is if you've given them that foundation, they most likely are going to identify that quickly and realize that that position or that role or that company is not for them. And so, you know, the best thing that parents can do 
is be supportive and love them unconditionally and help them build their network around them. Um, and even when they're doing, if they're doing internships, if they're in college or even their part-time jobs, all of that should be in safe, productive, respect, uh, respectful environments because that's building their, their foundation for entering the work world. And that, that goes for any child, by the way, not just queer children. I think that goes for any. The work world is hard. Uh, it, it's very different than school. It's very different than being at home. And so I think if you have confidence and a strong foundation, that carries you a long way. Um, so your childhood, I mean, you know, even though mm -hmm. we know, we know that, you know, you, you, you made it through and, and you're well adjusted <laughs> and you had a great career and you've written a book, you know, reading the passages about, about you being bullied constantly yeah. in school, you know, it was, it was, it was painful to read. Um, yeah. You know, so further on, uh, maybe the the advice. I mean, how how did you how did you persevere? I mean, that that it just sounds like it was brutal. It it was brutal. Uh, thank you. Uh, brutal to read. Brutal to write. Uh, again, I I had those, and I talk about it in the book. I had those friends who I did reach out to. It's it's such a different time, though, Adi. I was struggling with that in the seventies and eighties, right? I don't think schools, administrators, teachers counselors, mental health world was remotely equipped to deal with my situation. And uh, I do think there's a lot of available resources now for children who are questioning their sexuality. It's not always easy, but there's more available resources now. I had two amazing teachers and three friends who, even though I couldn't even say it out loud to myself, because I was still struggling with it internally, they gave me safe environments to just relaxing because it was pretty much a daily, the bullying, the physical, emotional, verbal taunting was pretty much daily. And, but I had a couple amazing hours in the day, including one independent study hour where it was me and one other student with a teacher. That was my refuge from all of that. And I just kept focused on, I knew that there was life for me outside of Toledo, Ohio. And I had some amazing older friends, uh, including a woman I talk about in the book, Amanda Miller, who I watched them get out and go away to school. And that became my drive. And I was, and I said, I have to get good grades. I have to study hard. I have to learn. I have to participate in clubs because I need to get scholarships and I need to go away from here because this place is not allowing me to really explore um, and identify who I am completely. So, I mean, that touches on the, the power of, of an ally, the power of somebody who, Huge. you know, connects with you for, for who you are and how that can be life changing. There, there, there's another question. This is from Mark from Chicago in the U.S. And it, it, it builds on that. You know, what are what are some tips um, for exercising allyship to the LGBTQ plus community? Yeah, I mean, I I think the LGBTQ community, I mean, we we walk hand in hand with our allies. And, and I think the entire uh, gay rights movement allies were a huge part uh, of that process and continue to be. And I feel that it's for the queer individual, for the LGBTQ individual, I, I talk about this term inviting people in rather than coming out, inviting people into your story. It's a vulnerability exercise and a trust exercise. When you identify someone who you think is going to be able to handle your story and handle your confidentiality and be honest with you and be your friend. And it's really on us as the queer individual to invite that other person into our story and then be willing to say to them, this is how you can help me and be willing to ask for help. I think, I think there's a huge thing about what I wrote about in the book. I went too long, not asking for help. I, I, I literally, there were people who were there that I could have asked for help but it was on me to say, hey, I've got something to tell you and I really, I really need to share and, and, and trust that it was going to be okay. So uh, I write, there's an entire chapter, uh, lear learning number four in the book is about nurture all of your families and continue chosen family. And I realized that I started building my chosen family when I was 14 and 15 years old in high school. And I didn't know what it was called. I didn't know I was building an ally network. There was no book to read. There was no guidebook to, to follow. But I realized that I was finding my confidence, confidants, and my confidence through my confidants. And I was 
charting these lifelong relationships that I'm still friends with people that I went to middle school with, that I went to high school with, and, and particularly my college friends, um, that that became a lifelong relationship and a support network that I needed. So the, the pressure that, that you felt to be normal, mm. um, you know, it must manifest itself in other ways other than just in sexual identity. And, you mm. know, I wonder, do you ever think about other ways in which we are adapting ourselves to some perception of normal to fit into corporate culture that may be similarly inauthentic or unhealthy? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think I love, listen, I love Hollywood. I love the media industry. Uh, I write about it in the book. It, it probably won't make me super popular, but um, you know, the car you drive, the clubs you belong to. If you have a second home, a vacation home, where is that vacation home? I think there's a lot of external trappings that are all about trying to fit in and all about trying to fit this norm of what a successful executive looks like or a successful uh, CEO looks like. And I'm not sure that all the reasons we do that are, are authentic. Listen, if you want to drive a super expensive car and that gives you joy, go for it if that's your authenticity. But if you're doing it because you're seeking external validation or someone giving you a thumbs up saying that's a really cool car and you somehow get better feelings out of that, I think that's where you have to look inward and say, what are my true motivations for doing this? And uh, I think it's a little bit of my Midwesternness, a little bit of my dad, God bless him. Um, I, I still talk to him every day, even though he's been gone 11 years, who was so, so Midwestern and so frugal and so uh, not wrapped up in external trappings that I, I, I still, every time I buy something expensive, I still hear him in my head saying, do you really need that? Like, I don't really think you need that. Okay, you need a new watch. Do you really need the Rolex? I think the Timex is fine. I can totally hear him saying that. But if it's something I'm doing for me and I'm comfortable in that for me, that's great. If I'm doing it because I want other people to say, oh, that's an amazing watch, that's a problem. That's a warning right. sign. Well, of course, uh, that's a brand identity too, the non-brand totally. yeah. brand identity. Um, all right, another question for the audience. This is from Ben from Chicago in the US. So. Um, I don't know if you thought about this, but now that many of us are working remotely or on a, mm. a hybrid basis, dispersed, um, you know, it's, it, it's a good question. How do we, you know, so maybe we're, we're making progress on some of these diversity, you know, inclusion issues. Um, but if we're remote, you know, how, how, how can we create and sustain a strong, authentic workplace when we're, when we're dispersed the way we are now? Mm. Thank you, Ben, so much for this question. I, I think this is a very real world challenge right now and a particular management challenge for myself uh, because I'm such a physical in-person manager. I think most of the examples in the book and the people that have worked with me, you said there's people that have worked with me on this call. They know I love like pulling everybody into rooms. I love small group meetings and big group meetings. And I read rooms really, really well. And I like to engage with people in that kind of setting. And I've had to learn new skills in this environment with Zoom and Google Meet and Teams and, and working virtually. And one of the things I worry about, Adi, honestly, is it can force you back into isolation. It can force you back into, you know, making a perfect little box that you're appearing in. But then, you know, once the camera gets turned off, you're actually very, very lonely and you're actually very like in your own thoughts. And so a lot of the companies that I work with right now through my consulting business at Archer Gray, most people are going back to some version of hybrid. Um, there's still some people that are 100% virtual, but most people are going back to some version of hybrid. And what I've been working with the executives that I consult with is that on those days where you're bringing back people into the offices to make sure that you're creating meetings and experiences and moments that make it worth them being in the office. And that can only happen when two or more people are in a room together. So brainstorming sessions or ideation sessions. Because the worst thing that I think can happen to a company right now is you say to people, I need you in the office Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then they come in and they sit at their desk all day and they're on Zoom meetings. You're going to have that problem where people will be like, I'd rather just do this from home then. You know, I could, I could take care of my children. I could take care of my pets. I could, I could just, you know, it would just be easier for me. And so I really think in this new work environment, you have to find ways that when your teams are in person, that there's real value in the activities you're having them do. And there's things, there's certain things that you can only do in person. I am old school, brainstorming, whiteboarding, 
those kind of ideation sessions, what do you would call them? I love having five or six people in a room with pieces of paper or whiteboards to write on. And I have tried every whiteboarding tool um, that, you know, goes with Zoom or Teams or Google Meet. It just has not been as effective for me. But I'm trying to learn because I'm respecting that this is the way of work today. Yeah, that makes sense. I and mean, we, we, we've talked about that, that on the show before that, you know, the, the, the workplace is a tool or the workplace is a clubhouse or it, it has right. to be something that, that makes sense if we're going to, if we're going to take the trouble of getting people to be back physically. Um, so your book is political in some ways. Mm. Uh, you know, you seem to have embraced uh, the notion that, you know, to come out, to, to be talking about your journey is a political act, particularly in this polarized mm -hmm. environment, um, you know, th that's probably a burden that, that many people wouldn't want. Right. People are happy with their choices, but not eager to be in the public arena. What, you know, what would be your advice for, for those people? Well, again, I mean, I do, I do think it's up to the individual. I think it's individual choice. I, I write in the book that I never thought just by living my lifestyle authentically, I'd become an activist. And, but I feel that where I am in my life right now, the, the, the times we're in right now, I have to continue to share my story because I don't feel that the narrative for the queer community can be controlled by either any part of the political spectrum, the far left, the far right, anybody. Like I need to share my story because it is my story and I don't want anyone else telling my story. And I realize that by living openly in the relationship I'm in and the style that I live in, that that can put a target on my back in some cases and that some people will not appreciate it or will not condone it or will not like it. And what I really hope, and I'm getting ready to go out on the road, you know, the book just came out this week I and mean, yesterday, ironically, and I'm sure that I'm going to get confronted in certain places. And I, I really hope it's healthy, honest discussion. And in some cases, if it's a debate, because I'm not, I'm not here to change people's minds. I'm trying just to expose people to the realities of how I live and, and what it's meant in my life. And I'm also trying to make it better for the generations that are coming behind me. And again, not just for queer generations. I feel that if we can create safe, respectful, empowering work environments and communities, that works for everybody. Because I think everybody wants to be safe and respected at work. I don't think it's just queer people or women or people of color, I think we all want to feel that I can be authentic and everybody has their own quirks and their own needs. And I think that's their, everybody has their own authenticity. My story is my story. Adi, you have a story. The people on this call, they all have a story. And I think everybody just wants to be respected and allowed to be the person they were meant to be. So when I look at the big picture, I think there's been a lot of progress. Um, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of, of enshrining rights or recognizing rights or recognizing auth authenticity. You know, at the same time, there's a there's a backlash. I mean, by the way, this conversation has been very U.S. focused and I understand yes, that the yes, discussions would be very different elsewhere. But, Globally, right. But OK, so we're talking mainly about the U.S. Um, environment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there is this backlash. I have, you know, I have a, a gay son. He's worried that, that you know, the rights of, of gay marriage could be rescinded with rescinded. A conservative you know, Supreme Court. Court. Mm -hmm. are, are, you, are, you, are you optimistic about the path of progress or, or do you feel like it's a, it's a battle and, you know, every day is a struggle? Uh, I'm, I'll first off say, start off by saying I'm an optimist by nature. I think the situation that we're in right now has made me be more pragmatic and a realist. I'm worried, like your son, I'm worried about the right to marry being rescinded by this court. Uh, when Roe versus Wade was overturned by the Supreme Court, we actually had a sitting Supreme Court justice who said that was the next thing on his agenda was the right to marry. So it's not like we should be surprised. There's over 500 pieces of anti-LGBTQ legislation pending across the United States, some of them in states, some of them in cities, some of them in school districts. That's a scary number. People are losing their jobs. People are quitting their jobs because of legislation in their particular uh, school district or municipality. I'm reading of families with gay children or trans children who are thinking about leaving certain municipalities because they don't have access to gender affirming mental health or medical care. 
uh, doctors who are quitting because they don't feel that they're able to provide the level of care to uh, an individual that they swore the Hippocratic Oath for. I, I read these stories every day and I, it does make me nervous. And so I think I have to be realistic and pragmatic. But I also think when I wrote the book, I never thought it would be coming out necessarily in this political environment. But it's what I've realized, it's more than just a book. It's a conversation. It's a community. And I have to continue to put myself out there and have conversations like we're having Adi and conversations with other people. Because the only way we're going to overcome this is by sharing our stories and sharing the facts and not allowing any part of the political spectrum to demonize our lifestyle. Yep. No, I like that. I Look, I mean, my only bit of wisdom from having been on this earth for a while is that, you know, th there's no guarantee of progress. You know, sometimes no. you, you, you sort of see it and imagine it's a straight line, but, but you really, you, you have to, you have to struggle for what you believe in. Cause yeah, there's, you nothing... can't take anything for granted, Adi. Right. Yeah. I, I, I write in the book, democracy is work and, and it's, it's a right. It's a responsibility, not a right. I say, and I, I've always been politically active and I've always been a donor and used my voice. And I think now, you know, that I work in a, in a different type of company in a smaller company with like-minded partners, I'm even more free than I've been maybe earlier in my career to um, share my authenticity in that sphere as well. Yep. So I want to, I want to go to, to another audience question and, you know, we're nearing the end of the show, but I want to yes. get to this. This is uh, from Darcy from Wisconsin in the U S so what are your thoughts on incorporating you know, uh, metrics, um, performance measures to include LGBTQ plus, you know, measurements of some kind. And, and, and if you think that's good, what kind of metrics would you recommend? Yeah, I, I think this is a great question. Thank you so much, Darcy. I, it's interesting. We, I've had this conversation in higher education, for example, a lot of the work I do in higher education where, uh, I would love to see on the admission forms even, or on applications, if people chose to identify as a member of the queer community that we could actually track. Because I, I, I think even just self-identifying as a community and being actually able to track the percentage of students who identify with a particular community could help towards allocating resources and, and recognizing the size of the community. I don't think there should be I, I don't think metrics should be used against us though, either. I think they have to be used to say, I would like to track all of the marginalized or minority communities in my company or in my community, not just the queer community. Uh, and to look and see, are we being representative in our business practices, in our community practices, in, in how we're conducting ourselves. And so I, I think sometimes just a simple, honest census is the first metric that I would be an advocate of. Um, and then, you know, of course, once you have that, you can start to go deeper into the community because LGBTQIA+, there's a lot of different identities within that community. And I also think we have to be careful about saying what works for one part of the queer community will absolutely work for another part of the queer community. I think we are, we are different, we are sub-communities within the larger community as well. Yeah. So Jim, I wanna thank you for for sharing your story uh, on this show and in the book, lots of heart emojis floating by <laughs> on, <laughs> on LinkedIn as you tell your personal That's story. So but nice. anyway, the book is just out. It's called All Pride, No Ego and uh, by Jim Fielding. Jim, thank you for being on the show. Oh my gosh, an incredible opportunity, Adi. I really appreciate you and your entire team and everybody who called in today. All right, great. Good luck. Thank you. Okay, just a reminder, you can watch previous episodes of the show on YouTube or right here on LinkedIn and Facebook. My guest next week, so that's August 23rd at 12 noon Eastern time, will be Rafaela Sedin, a professor at Harvard Business School. The primary focus of her research is on how effective leadership can lead to productivity gains. It will be, we'll be covering a number of topics, including how to reskill your organizations in the age of AI. So if you're an HBR subscriber watching this, you can head to hbr.org newsletters to sign up for the New World of Work newsletter, where I offer an inside look each week at these interviews and talk about some of the biggest ideas that come from them. And if you like content like this, why not subscribe to our magazine and website? The address is hpr.org slash subscriptions. And finally, we want to thank again our friends at KPMG 
who are our sponsors for this season of the New World of Work. And thank you all for tuning in today. I'm Adi Ignatius, and this is the New World of Work.